This is the Good Neighbor Podcast, the place where local businesses and neighbors come together. Here's your host, Jeff Gardner. Welcome to another episode of the Good Neighbor Podcast. Today, we have another good neighbor on, Deb Hennig of Action First Aid. Deb, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to have you here. I'm looking forward to learning about what Action First Aid is. I know very little about it, and uh, I like being in that uh, in that uh, position, as the same position as the audience. So let's let's get right into it. What is Action First Aid, Deb? Okay, so Action First Aid is a, a company that myself and my husband have been running for 27 years now. Uh, we're based out of Barrie. Um, as a former teacher, I was a high school phys ed and science teacher, absolutely loved that job, mm -hmm. but I had been bringing somebody into the high school to uh, deliver CPR training to the grade nine students, and that was 30 years ago, and um, that's when I kind of got interested, and I thought, you know what, I really wanted to stay home with kids. I was hoping to have a family, which we did, wanted to stay home with kids, and I'm like, okay, I could teach CPR uh, evenings and weekends to kind of make ends meet, so that's kind of how our, our business started. Um, and, uh, my husband, I guess, probably six years later, kind of left his, his job as well. And we started action first aid. And so we have been delivering first aid CPR defibrillator training, uh, primarily in the province of Ontario, but we do have approvals outside of, uh, Ontario into other provinces. Mm -hmm. We've been selling defibrillators, the life-saving machines that are needed when someone's in sudden cardiac arrest. And then we were kind of a um, also co-founders of a, of a brand called Save Station, which is bringing AEDs outside into the community and trying to drive much needed awareness about when and how to use a life-saving defibrillator. So is that what a, a defibrillator is? Is that the acronym for it? An AED? That's right. That's right. And yeah, and not a lot of people knew about that, right? And still know about it. So Exactly. So that's when a few of us came together and said, wait a minute, you know, there's not enough people like most people that come to a course have to take a course. So the people that come to our training center here in Barrie and elsewhere, it's it's highly regulated industry. So a certain number of people have to take training. But really, the majority of people probably understand, yeah, I really should learn CPR, but rarely does anybody just take a course and and not enough people probably even understand how to use an AED automated external defibrillator. So yeah, and not to mention, I, people forget. So it's nice to know that you have a good uh, a resource out there like yourself. I, I went to firefighting college for okay. two years. Yeah. So we dealt with defibrillators. If they told me the acronym, completely forgot it. Yeah. And then I also, uh, I'm an addictions counselor on the weekend at a wonderful place called Cornerstone to Recovery. Kind of what I do, it's like near and dear to my heart. I, I love uh, being over there with those people. We also mm -hmm. got trained in CPR and the defibrillator came up and again, uh, if they said it, I forgot it. So <laughs> you forget these things. I mean, I've had CPR training, I don't know, two or three or four times. I had it as a personal trainer. I had it as uh, uh, in firefighting college. And then I had it at the addiction facility. But all of those were years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and you forget. So it's nice to have a really good resource out there. And you were saying you want to put it out into the public so that people are aware of it and have a better level of education about it. Yeah, well, that's part of it. I mean, I think I was referencing Save Station in particular when mm -hmm. when I when you've kind of picked up on that point. So um, AEDs or defibrillators, you know, have been basically in public buildings for over 20 years now. Mm -hmm. um, but as you can imagine, right, you might go into a hockey rink or the library or certain buildings and, and retail spaces and you'll start noticing them on the wall. Um, but it was about seven years ago that actually my husband kind of started to notice or more than that, that um, we traveled over in Europe and we noticed that there were defibrillators on outside. And we're like, wow, we don't have that in Canada anywhere. So he started mm -hmm. researching the outdoor cabinet space and really was um, kind of, I think I, I credit, you know, his, his vision to say, okay, let's start bringing them here. And we started to pilot them and placing them outside. So we went to Mayor Lehman and we said, Hey, this is, this is an idea. We, we have AEDs indoors, but I think we really need to inspire people to think we need them 24 seven accessible. So after, 
you know, the doors close at the end of the day, they get locked up. So we really need to get them closer to people. Um, and maybe we can get into why and the importance of time. So, so that's kind of started, that was started a big journey of ours where we uh, tested um, in partnership with city of Barrie, uh, an outdoor AED and, uh, and it was great. It stayed warm. It, um, it wasn't stolen, you know, which are some of the things because it's fully accessible. But mm -hmm. then what we realized is, you know, all those things um, were successful. But then we stood down at the beach where we placed it and we started to ask people kind of running by, walking by, do you know that it's here? And they didn't even notice it. Do you know how to use it? I wouldn't feel comfortable. And so, again, there was a team of us um, who stepped back and said, wait a minute. OK, we've just provided the access, but now we need to really really expand on the awareness and the education piece because it's really the public that needs to understand um you know that that's for them it's for the public to use before medical help arrives so save station is a is actually a, a brand and a product that we created that houses any defibrillator on the market and it's and it's designed to kind of drive more awareness and more education and what do we use a defibrillator for so a defibrillator is needed when somebody goes into sudden cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. And that's different than a heart attack. A lot of people sometimes confuse those two terms. But a heart attack is if someone's experiencing a heart attack, um, there's a clogged artery somewhere in the heart and a certain part of the heart is not getting blood and oxygen. Um, but the person is conscious and they're breathing. They still need medical attention immediately. But when somebody goes into sudden cardiac arrest, it means basically they're unresponsive and the heart is now in an abnormal rhythm. And, you know, good and bad, but, um, you know, 75% of the times that somebody suddenly collapses like that. And it's, and it's also, maybe we should start by saying it's, a, it's still one of the number one causes of death in North America. And, mm -hmm. you know, the stats right now from heart and stroke are one person every 11 minutes collapses in sudden cardiac arrest and what is absolutely critical is that the first 10 minutes so we have basically no more than 10 minutes to save a life within the first four minutes there's little very little brain damage but after four minutes when the brain is not with oxygen um, and the heart muscle itself is not with oxygen um, brain damage starts to set in and at the 10 minute mark it's irreversible so this is where the, the need for a defibrillator, the public to grab one and use it, feel confident, and good effective CPR is critical. And that's really what's gonna save lives and prevent unnecessary death. And, and it's also, it's a, it, it can happen to young people too. Maybe we could come back to that at some point, but. Yeah, it really important information. I mean, it just taught me so much there. And, and one of the things that was going through my head during that time was a question my brain brought up was, you know, where's the most common place for people to, to go into in cardiac arrest? I imagine a good portion of them are, are that's happening at home. You're right. Yeah. Ironically, it is right. There's a, there's a large percentage of people that, you know, do suffer sudden cardiac arrest at home. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe to that point, and this wasn't scripted, but it's interesting you brought that up because one of the programs that we're super passionate about is basically it's called the neighborhood safe station program. And so we, for example, placed a defibrillator, okay, in a safe station on the side of our home because, and then we basically hosted a, a life-saving block party and we brought all of our neighbors on our street and they came over and in one hour we showed everybody how to use it. We told them it's there for them 24-7. Um, we did a CPR and AED kind of demo in the backyard. Mm -hmm. And, and it's amazing because now we've just brought this group of people together, some neighbors who had never met each other. And so this is kind of a concept that we're inspiring other neighborhoods to do. And we've had some great engagement in Barry, but, uh, I think there's so much work we could do just right in our own communities. And it's kind of similar to the, to the old block parent. If you, maybe you're not old enough to have remembered the block parent, but some of us on this show maybe are, and it's just caring for one another, right? That's what we do here. I mean, uh, that's, that's the whole point of this is caring for our local communities and helping provide quality education, getting good exposure out there uh, as knowledge can be very powerful and it can change the trajectory of your life. 
Are there defibrillators for a home? Like, is this something we should consider having in our homes? People are buying them for their homes and their cottages. Yeah. So there's a variety of different defibrillators on the market. We sell every single one. We mm -hmm. train on everyone. We support everyone. And every AED has kind of, you know, different features. So depending on what someone's looking for, um, that's kind of what our team helps everybody do is just understand what's important to you. Do you want pediatric capabilities? Do you feel that you need a bilingual device? Do you want compression feedback? There's different features and then obviously different price points, but you can basically have any AED in your home um, and they are designed for kind of the lay rescuer somebody who's had no training. We, we strongly encourage training because it's the situation. A defibrillator is very easy to use, but the situation is very traumatic. You're dealing sure. with somebody who is clinically they're dead. So we have to kind of encourage people to understand that anything you do is better than nothing. Um, AEDs are amazing now. You turn them on and they start speaking to you and everybody's very, very comforted once they actually see that that's kind of how... Uh, how a defibrillator is set up is to help you. And then of course, 911, right? We always, number one thing is to call 911 and then you would let them know what's going on. And, and the, the 911 operators are, are incredibly strong at coaching people through what to do until medical responders like take right over. So important. I mean, uh, I was I was thinking about my grandfather's situation. He went, uh, he was non-responsive. So he went into sudden cardiac arrest. This was a while back and luckily <clears throat> my grandmother was quick enough to uh to respond to call the uh, to call 911 and get the ambulance there but damage was done i mean he was not the same afterwards mm -hmm. and that led to complications down the line so that's why i thought like i imagine a, a number of people we're in our homes so much mm -hmm. right so you know, it, it, it can, it can just happen. I imagine my yeah. grandfather's case wasn't unique. So had we had a defibrillator in there, would it have made a difference? At least it would have given us a chance to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I'm really happy that, that, uh, there is availability for them to be in the homes, but also that the level of education is going up. Um, your, yeah. your mission to provide more awareness, I think is so important as, we don't get a lot of chances uh, at that. It's it's like in many cases one and done. So yeah. if we can be more prepared, more educated, and certainly more confident in yeah. those situations, like we have the defibrillator at uh, the addiction clinic, and uh, we've used it when we went in training, and it was speaking to us, and it was very easy to use, and we practiced on our mannequins, uh -huh. and then just going through it once or twice. I think it was a four-hour training or something, but just going through it once or twice, you're like, wow, this is more yeah. simply now i can prolong yeah. the life to get to uh to get them to the point of being a little bit better off when the ambulance comes yeah exactly and and to your point right i think a lot of people think you have to put yourself in a two-day course and yeah there's two-day courses that still exist that you know you have to take for a workplace for example but mm -hmm. you know i think most of us in this industry now are saying you know what we need to we need to grab as many people as possible and in less than an hour everybody can learn cpr and understand how to use a defibrillator so um we, we've just built out some I think really, really strong online learning tools as well. So we have a program launching pretty soon called CPR in 60. And um, there's some incredible resources there. So it, there are definitely things out there in, in the community that it doesn't have to be a, a big full day commitment. Because we know, we know running a training center, the only people typically that come are there because you have to. So right. very few people actually say, you know what, on this Sunday, I'm going to take a CPR class. But um, we, we hope more people consider that. Yeah, I mean, as education grows, awareness grows and ease of access. Mm -hmm. If I have to make a large investment, even though this is a very good education to have and can be absolutely life saving, you know, people often take the, uh, the path of least resistance. So if you can make it easier for us, easier to understand, mm -hmm easier to um, access and quicker. Yeah. And yeah, I imagine more people are going to get educated by it and that awareness uh, will spread over time. Something that we love talking about on the show is the yeah. story behind uh, why we do what we do. It's been a very valuable question to me to ask why uh, in my life, uh, as we sometimes find ourselves just doing things and not mm -hmm. really uh, being intentional about it. So we like to ask our guests, why did you get into this? So what is the story 
behind you told us a little bit already mm-hmm. how you started it and how long it's been but why did you get into this why get into first aid yeah well i you know maybe just as i mentioned at the beginning i you know i was first introduced to it because i had been bringing somebody into the high school to deliver the training and it was a young girl she was in grade 11 and i think she had been a lifeguard and became a cpr instructor and you know i ran around and grabbed the students to take the course but i sat there as a participant and it was it was really interactive um and you you just instantly feel like wait a minute this is a skill like i had no idea what to do and it just instantly spoke to me. And I, and as I mentioned, I, I love teaching high school teaching, but I did want to be home with kids. So I did start because I thought, okay, I need a way to help make money and pay the bills. And so I got involved and, um, you know, I, I'm from a very entrepreneurial family. I grew up in a family that my parents ran their own business. So I do think that sometimes becomes part of you as well. And uh, sure. I, it really mattered to me to be home with kids first and foremost. And I figured, okay, this is a way I could do it. And I just, I've never looked back. I mean, I've been passionate from the day we started and I love, uh, I love the design of curriculum. I love kind of creating something. I think the courses that I had taken, you know, I found, I, I sat back and thought, okay, I think we can do this differently. And I've, I've always been on a journey to think, okay, how can we, we have to get through curriculum. There's certain things we have to teach, but how can we do this where someone walks away and says, wow, like, I'm really glad I was forced to take it. And so that's actually what I found the training side of the business to be is you, you're just meeting amazing people every day and you're taking a group of strangers who often, as I say, maybe didn't even want to be there. And you're just kind of, it's, it's, it's a whole, um, it's, it's quite a development throughout the day of even just getting everybody comfortable with the skills, getting to know one another, laughing at themselves a little bit, and just basically walking away and saying, okay, you know what? I, I at least have some confidence to step in and say, I can do something. I can take action until someone else comes. And it's just that sense of empowerment. So that's kind of what's been driving us. And then the AED side of the business, I mean, I don't know, I can't imagine anything more important than selling a life-saving device. I know there's other important missions, so I probably shouldn't say that, but this has been to me <laughs> right up there with yeah. saying, yeah. and, and, you know, we've unfortunately met, I've done a lot of bit of, a lot of work in the States over the last seven years with these outdoor safe stations and working with um, a pretty strong parent group. It's called parent heart watch in the States. And that is basically 20 years strong and it's parents who have lost children from sudden cardiac arrest. And when you hear those stories and you understand what they've gone through, it drives you to say, okay, you know what? There's so much more we need to do because people think of this as being an older, something's going to happen to an older person and it can, but it can happen to any age, but then there's a lot of healthy kids that just can go into sudden cardiac arrest. And that's when a defibrillator is absolutely necessary and that is when lives are saved so that's been really giving me an extra i say lift in the last in the second half of you know this journey um and then and then we had as i say we started you know creating this safe station product we started to place them outdoors they're now in you know very high profile kind of units they're lit up at night so people notice them there's messaging on there saying you have the power to save a life And um, it was absolutely incredible a year and a half ago to get our very first call that um, we had our very first save. And it was a 12 year old girl who was saved playing soccer in just outside of Seattle, Washington and um, complete unknown heart history. And she collapsed. And because somebody else um, had placed a save station, um, we worked with them, but they had lost a good friend of theirs. So it was in memory of his friend who was also a very healthy young soccer athlete. And because of all these things coming together, um, this young girl, Nina, was saved. And we had the chance to meet her and meet the family. And and then a week later, we had our very second save. And it was a 16-year-old boy in Sonoma Valley, California, who was also a safe station was placed in memory of another young boy who died. His name was Michael, playing basketball. And his mom you know, has dedicated her life now to say nobody else should go through this. So she placed a safe station in Sonoma Valley in an outdoor beautiful park. And um, 
one night at nine o'clock at night, three boys were playing, four boys were playing basketball and a boy named Michael, 16 years old, collapsed and a safe station, you know, was lit up just close by. And those boys had taken CPR in high school, noticed the AED and grabbed it. And so that was our second save. We had one more, but that's really what drives us now to keep, keep going. Yeah, I can't think of too many things more motivating than that. It was one of the reasons why I wanted to become a firefighter. It didn't pan out for me. I, it turns out that I am too colorblind to be a firefighter oh. in Ontario. Yeah. Oh, I and didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know it either. And they didn't test me until I graduated. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's worked out for me. Uh, I enjoy my life quite a bit. But that must be incredibly fulfilling work. And I yeah. can see why it would be so motivating um, do you mainly work with businesses and schools or is it, uh, do you work with the, uh, residential public side as well? Yeah, basically, um, yeah, we would have from a training perspective, we have individuals that need it for resume for schools. Um, and then, you know, most of our work is, you know, corporate training. Um, mm -hmm. but then there's individuals purchasing defibrillators for home and cottage, and then, of course, there's, you know, we're, we're servicing businesses, universities, municipalities. Um, we also built a, you know, kind of a, a piece of technology that helps larger organizations manage defibrillators. And that's an area that's been a real challenge is that, you know, people have invested in AED, but then they haven't always been given the tools to kind of make sure that their pads and batteries, you know, stay current. So, we have a tracking tool that we basically give free to our customers and it helps them make sure that, you know, they get alerted when their pad or battery expires. That's mm -hmm. super important. And then really you're supposed to be checking it once a month. It's a quick check and you look at it and you make sure green lights flashing, flashing or there's a check mark. So we've created kind of a, a tool that helps companies um, just remain compliant too. And is, do you do a fair bit of work in Simcoe County or are you spread out all over the province? Like, is, is there an area of focus since you're in Barrie? Well, we've always wanted to do as much as we possibly can in Barrie. And, and, it, and so, yes, we do. I mean, our, our head office and our main training center is in Barrie. So we have a super busy training center. We have three big, large, bright training rooms that are busy almost every day of the week. So we're servicing our community. We, um, we do, we love to give back to our community. We do a lot of, you know, we donate AEDs for lots of good causes and we donate training for lots of groups that need it. Um, and then, as I say, our first save station was placed in the heart of Barrie. So we're always very thankful to the city of Barrie for supporting that. And uh, we'd absolutely like to, to see more defibrillators in our community. But in terms of our business, we're definitely branching out and um, we're actually getting a lot of traction in the US on the outdoor side. It seems to be there a little bit faster just with being able to make decisions. And, you know, people naturally have concerns when you place an AED outside, could it get stolen, you know? And, um, but I think that uh, we've got some good, good um good data now that's saying that yeah anybody could take it but it's very very low what we're finding people are really respecting these so mm -hmm. um yeah we're excited all the work in the states but i still want to see canada keep uh keep understanding and driving driving this movement forward too wonderful um some common myths or misconceptions we we talk about a, a handful of things you'll get a handful of themes here we talk about the why the story we talk about hard things on the show and we really uh, talk about knowledge and wisdom and sharing our experiences and our education, with the people who may be unaware to empower them with information. So now they can make better decisions. Really, it is about uh, empowering people with with quality information. So myths and misconceptions, they're in every industry. And there could be some people out there that could say, this is too hard for me, too confusing for me. I don't know. I'm not going to touch it. I'm too uncertain. Mm -hmm. So is there any myths or misconceptions that come um, with your industry or what you do that you could kind of clarify for the audience? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, a few come to mind right off the top. I think the number one thing, if we're going to continue down the topic of CPR, right, which is really, you know, kind of your worst case scenario, if you have to provide CPR, right, or if you have to provide first aid is to deliver CPR because somebody's mm -hmm. clinically dead. But I think the concern people raise commonly asked questions are, well, can I hurt them? And I could make them worse. 
So those are two ones and I could be sued. Those are probably the three number one questions and I could break the ribs. So basically those are maybe the four commonly asked questions. And I think it does just come down to people understanding that if someone is, is in sudden cardiac arrest, they are clinically dead. You cannot make them worse. Um, anything you do for them is better than nothing. Right. And so um, that's, I think, rule number one. And um, the second thing is, yes, you can break ribs, um, mm -hmm. that you don't have to break ribs for it to be effective, but you absolutely could break ribs. And But again, we have to understand that ribs, and sometimes it's the cartilage that, you know, we have our sternum and our mm -hmm. ribs attached by cartilage. So sometimes the cartilage can tear as that, you know, cavities being pushed down. Sometimes ribs can break, but the ribs can heal, but the brain cannot heal. After right. 10 minutes, there's permanent irreversible brain damage. So that's, I think, number two. Um, number three, probably, and not necessarily in this particular order, but people, some people worry about getting sued. And um, it's super important that everybody realizes that you know, everybody is 100% protected. There's the Good Samaritan Act. It's written differently in every province and every state, but we have a very strong system that backs us. And it says, if you step in, you do the very best you can in an emergency. Um, and as long as you stay within the scope of your training, meaning you're not doing something really way beyond the scope of your training, some kind of advanced, you know, maneuver, then, um, then you're 100% protected. So that's super important that everybody realizes um, that as well. So I think, did I answer the four? I had you mentioned said, four. Yeah, four. So there was. You could be sued. You could make the person the worse, break the ribs. And I'm forgetting the four. Uh oh, the someone's four. listening saying, oh, it's this. <laughs> um, It'll yeah. come to us. It'll come hurt to them? Us. Can I break my ribs? Can I sue them? Yeah, I can't remember, but I mean, really, oh, how often? Well, and oh, sorry. I mean, one one thing too. People are worried about. I didn't mention this, but um, people are worried about strangers. And what happens if I just randomly? It's someone I don't know, and they collapse oh, yeah. in front of me. So there's natural concerns and fears about: Can I catch something? Can I? I don't want to touch them. And of course, when COVID was going on, right? That yeah. was a whole journey for us to go through. Is how do you teach CPR? when it's very hands-on, when you can't touch anybody and stuff. So, but um, I think it's super important that everybody realizes that CPR, it's strong, compression only CPR is strongly recommended for the majority of people um, because we do understand that people aren't comfortable putting their mouth on, on, a, on a stranger. Mm -hmm. It's actually a difficult skill to do, to actually really do a good head tilt and you know, maybe you don't have a mask, maybe you don't want to put your mouth on somebody have to ventilate into them. So we do still teach 30 compressions, two breaths for CPR, but it's also, we also tell everybody that if you're not comfortable, if you don't have a mask, if you don't feel the breaths are going in, then you absolutely, we want everybody to do compression only. And it's not we as in us, this is, this is a, it's a regulated industry. There's guidelines that come down from heart and stroke and American heart. And so those are the guidelines that are now, um, it's well studied and it's compression only CPR is super effective. It keeps blood going to the brain. A lot of people don't realize what you're actually doing when you do CPR. All you're really accomplishing or intended to accomplish is your number one job is to push hard enough and fast enough in the center of the chest to move blood to the brain, to keep the brain alive until the defibrillator arrives. Yeah, so, you're pumping the you're manually pumping the heart to keep yes, cycling blood through the body. That's right. And you know what? Picture like a soap pump. You start pumping your soap pump. It doesn't always the, the soap doesn't come out right away. Right. It might take a mm. couple pumps, three, four or five. And finally it comes out. So that's another reason for compression only CPR is it might take seven or eight times of really good compressions to finally get blood moving to the brain. And then sometimes to stop, to give the two breaths, you've lost the, the pressure in the system. So that's, you know, for, for a number of reasons that compression only CPR is strongly recommended for the lay rescue or people that have not taken training. Um, and it's just a little bit easier. So for the people listening, you can't make them worse. Breaking a rib, I imagine, I mean, they told us that it was pretty rare that a rib actually broke. It happens. 
Um, but they told us more about that cartilage uh, when I was in firefighting college that you were talking about. Uh -huh. You can't make them worse. And worst case scenario for you uh, is compressions. Just get that heart pumping. That's right. Yeah. One other thing too that is is really kind of important information is a lot of people don't know when um, when to start CPR. And what happens is the minute somebody goes into sudden cardiac arrest, there's often something that kicks in when somebody's in that state and it's agonal breathing. So basically it's the body's last gasps to, to breathe. And some people have witnessed this when you want some, somebody pass away. And so it can actually look like a seizure. It can be, people can think, oh, they're, they're breathing or they're gasping. Well, we have to really understand that that is basically, you almost have to expect that you're gonna see that kind of abnormal breathing. Mm -hmm. And that is not normal effective breathing. So if you witness that and they're unresponsive and they're not waking up, <laughs> call 911, call for an AED, and then um, begin CPR immediately. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Life-saving information right there. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Okay. Outside of business, Deb, what do you get up to for fun? I mean, this very much seems, and a lot of our entrepreneurs come on the show. So many entrepreneurs out there really do something that they're very passionate about. Often they've answered a problem in their own life that they learned a new skill. Now they mm -hmm. can help other people answer it. So we get a lot of our entrepreneurs saying, I love what I do, or I'm doing my stuff all the time because I enjoy it. But there is something beyond business. Um, so what do you get up to when you're not in business mode, when you're not out there teaching people how to save lives? All right. Well, you know what? I think I have to lead with the fact that I have three kids and have absolutely loved being a mom. And uh, while juggling a, a really busy life in business, I I never missed a game. I don't think I'm, yeah, maybe the odd game, but we traveled all over all over the province at all the sports games there. They're kind of past some of that now, but I, uh, what do I do? I play tennis. I love tennis. Um, I uh, started a hiking group with a group of ladies and uh, it was locally? inspired. Locally. Yeah. My mom inspired me years ago. She started this 30 years ago back in Unionville and these ladies have been hiking for 30 years and it's incredible because there's an age gap. The oldest one just had her 90th birthday. My mom turned 80, 80 and the other one was in 70 and there's been like, I think 18 of these ladies. So I, this, this was my year to say, you know what, it's time for me to uh, try and do this. So I can't do it once a week, but once a month, there's a group of us now. We just started and we're kind of starting local and we're going into different woods and, you know, hiking. And then uh, it'll it'll take us a little bit further. So that's been uh, that's been fun. And the other day I went in the lake. I um, I did my first plunge. In, in fact, it happened because we were hiking in one of the the hikes took us to the water and then as we were walking by centennial beach and mm -hmm. there was people out there and one of the friends of mine said oh yeah i've been plunging you know three times a week and i'm like what really i want to yeah. try that so my friend and i just yesterday went down and said let's do this so we uh we marched down and yes a really nice guy stopped and saw that it was our first time and he's like okay i better I better make sure you girls are okay. And anyway, we got in there. We only lasted for, I think, 30 seconds. But anyway, we'll, we'll get better at that. So, yeah. yeah. And there's so much phenomenal literature and, and research backing what cold water exposure does to us. And if you can get it out in nature, like I, I'm, I'm in my little office here and I have a, a sliding door to walk out. And so I have a, like a, a man-sized garbage can that oh, I just you the hose. It? Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I don't have a lake nearby currently and um, uh, it's just easier because I make a mess in the tub. So I just yeah. fill the hose up and put a bag of ice in there and spend a couple of minutes uh, yeah. really nice in the winter uh, yeah. too. Although people think I'm, I'm crazy. My neighbors do, but really calming. Yeah. Once you get past that first minute yeah. and those pins and needles go away, it's just a wonderful, like this nice kind of spiritual mm -hmm. uh, experience. So I'm glad you're getting out in the, in the lake. It's, it's such a cool thing. I don't hear many people <laughs> talk about getting into a cold plunge in, in the lake or cold plunge at all. I think it's great that you're doing that. Yeah. Well, as I say, it's, I just did my first one. So I, I did say, Hey, we're going to, each time we're going to just, I said, even 10 more seconds, right? That's, that's, that's how you start. So that's it. Yeah. yeah. Couple, of, couple of minutes is the goal. I mean, that's, two minutes of me, I'm out. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, 
so I told you before, we like talking about why the story and then hard things. That's something we really like talking about on this show because we found that it is being talked about more, mm -hmm. um, that hard things are being celebrated, our challenges in, in our life story. Mm -hmm. um, but still, many of us, myself included, and when I was younger, I would be embarrassed about them or I would, I would feel shameful about a failing or some challenge that I couldn't overcome in that moment. Uh, that roadblock stopped me dead. Um, but now we're trying to shine a light on that a bit more on this show as well. And, and many other um, platforms out there are trying to show that there's so much growth to be had when we not only don't tamp these hardships down, but celebrate them because they help make us who we are. If, if everything went our way perfectly every day, all the time, life would be boring. I think if everything uh -huh. went good all the time, I don't think we'd recognize good uh, it's because of the bad that we recognize the good and there's value in both. So we like to ask our guests on the show, is there any hardships, trials, or tribulations that you're comfortable sharing with us that probably sucked when you went through it? It seems like the greatest things in life for me anyways uh -huh. are often the hardest roads and are usually um, paid for with upfront pain and this uh -huh. long-term gain. Um, whereas comfort is kind of upfront pleasure and, and long-term discomfort in many cases. But is there anything that comes to mind that probably sucked in the moment, but when you look back at it, there's no regret there. Actually, maybe you're grateful for that experience in your life because it helped make you who you are today. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question for sure. Um, and you're right. We sh should spend more time talking about that, right? Cause we could all benefit from hearing what other people have gone through. The, I think the I main thing that comes to mind for for me personally and and it does relate to safe station as we you know this this vision was really and again there, there's someone locally too in barry who was part of coming up with this whole concept and um the goal really was that we realized that there wasn't a universal kind of look to a defibrillator okay so mm -hmm. when you start looking at every aed indoors there's different size shapes cabinets, colors, different messaging on them, and there's no consistent look and feel. Mm. So when we realized that we needed to, to construct one outside to make it visible, we thought, okay, but look at all the ones indoors. So that's, we basically, that's where kind of Safe Station as a brand materialized, where we thought, okay, this is really almost a no brainer. They should all look the same, just like a London phone booth or a hospital sign. And so a group of us kind of really started working and saying, okay, we really need to try and create a universal housing solution. So when we came up with this concept of safe station, it's for any AED on the market. We then wanted to basically share this concept and this product with as many people in the industry as possible. And um, at the time, I remember the person that was working with this guy, local guy, and he seemed to think, well, of course we do. And I'm like, yeah, but there's different competitors and not everybody really wants to work together. So we kind of thought, no, okay, it's still worth it. Let's see if we can do it. So we kind of launched this into the industry. And I personally would have made many phone calls to competitors of ours who, you know, we're all competing in some way, shape or form sometimes. Right. But, um, and I'm like, okay, if you can buy this type of cabinet for the same price as the white cabinet you're putting, um, I think this is the goal for the public so that the public knows what to look for. And so we've had amazing partners come on board who kind of believe in that that's the right thing. But then we've also had some really disturbing situations happen where people that we are working with selling save stations too. And then all of a sudden we find out behind the scenes that they're completely copying the product and knocking it off. And all of a sudden, so, and that's happened probably three different times, a um, couple times in the States, one, one in, in Canada on the West coast. Now the person on the West coast has since come back and said, you know what, this is harder than it seemed. We're actually ditching our knockoff product and we're now going to kind of come back. But that's been for sure. The hardest thing is to actually even work with people who, you find out behind the scenes have a capacity to do that. Um, and I think sometimes it comes down to money and greed. And we uh, sometimes it's confusing that people can believe that there's like, you know, a, a purpose to work together. So, so yeah, that's kind of been 
definitely a challenging thing for us to to work through. But um, it's told us that it's probably a good idea, the safe station concept. But at the same time, it's it's been challenging to to get to know people well, people that you really trust. And then you think hmm, that's kind of so that's been a challenge. So you asked about a challenge and that's definitely one that we're we're still kind of working on. But I think there's just too much good momentum. And when you keep surrounding yourself with good people and yep. definitely some people, some relationships can go sideways. And I found that really, really hard personally. I really feel that I were family business and I pour my heart and soul into the people I work with. So sometimes that can really surprise you. But um, anyway, you just keep uh, keep moving forward. So. Yeah, it's tough when you put your heart out there, you put your blood, sweat and tears into something and you really um, foster a relationship for trust and you get burned. Um, it stings, uh, yeah. especially when you had the greatest intentions uh, there and it was an honest relationship, at least you felt. But it certainly teaches us uh, about other people. Um, I found myself to be a little bit more cautious, not more guarded. I find myself more open now and vulnerable than ever, but I am more cautious with who I bring into my inner circle, if you will. Uh, I think my standards have changed simply from being burnt. So I, I think the quality of my life has gone up because some of those relationships have turned sideways because I was maybe a little bit too frivolous with, with my trust or too lenient, something along those lines. But I have become more cautious and therefore my relationships have gotten deeper rather than more relationships it's the fewer that have gone deeper. That's certainly how it's affected me. And I appreciate you sharing that story with us. I think yeah. uh, a lot of entrepreneurs have been through something similar. Uh, it's not unique to your business, um, no. uh, our partnerships, you know, out there, but it teaches us things uh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would say that I think I still want to keep living my life where I trust my instincts and you know what, I think it's, it doesn't happen very often in the big scheme of things. Right. I think we all have to kind of believe in one another and uh, yeah. So. Beautiful. I think that's well said. Something that you wish our listeners knew about action first aid. What's one thing that comes to mind that you really want to narrow down for them so they can know. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, from as a company, we're, we're obviously, we pride ourselves on, you know, kind of creating a, when you have to take training, we don't want you to dread it. We want you to, you know, come and trust that, you know, we've poured a lot of time and energy into creating an amazing, you know, innovative training experience. Um, and then we're also here to, to help, right? We, we have lots of people on this team that if you're just even thinking about a defibrillator or, um, you're not really sure how to get started. You want to try and start something at your cottage or crowdfunding and you just want to kind of get some ideas, right? We're also, we're here to kind of support questions and sometimes these things take time. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, we're very, um, we're very interested in our local community. We want to support people. So if people in the community feel that we can also support them in some way, we, did, we give away a lot of prizes for golf tournaments and mm -hmm. there's always something somebody needs. We have great little items we can donate and training we can donate. So please reach out to us directly if, uh, if we can help in that capacity as well. Well, I think that's a great way to pivot because uh, the final question is how can people find out about you, Deb? Oh, okay. Well, uh, the good old internet is how you can find us. So actionfirstaid.ca is our website. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have a second website, savestation.ca, but Action First Aid has lots of information too about outdoor and it has, um, yeah, I think Action First Aid is the main site and you can kind of go from there. Wonderful. And then I have a secret question that uh -huh. I ask at the end okay. that I put on the questionnaire. And I'll be quick because we're slowly running out of time here, but I like to provide a little bit of context and uh, I've been very lucky. I talk about them pretty much on every episode, uh, which there's been many. So I'm kind of a broken record, but I talk about my mentors. I think behind, uh, I love this quote behind every excellent person. There's an excellent teacher. You are providing great education out there. That's what we're trying to do is to get experts on to provide great education. As I believe now knowledge and wisdom move us forward. And um, certainly for my own life, that's been my own experience. In my early 20s, I was lucky to attach myself to a great mentor, and she taught me to think about my impact. She taught me to think about my impact up to that moment. She said, I think it would be very prudent of you to think about what has your impact been up to this 23 years on this earth. 
Maybe there's things you don't like about it. Maybe there's things you regret. Maybe there's things you do like. But once you start to identify these things, now you can start planning your impact going forward. She taught me to think about my impact of each day because there's no guarantee that I'll be here tomorrow. And then if I am here uh, for however, however long I am here for, what do I want my impact to be going forward? So essentially, we like to ask our guests, what do you want your impact to be on this world? Oh, wow. Okay. It could be family. It could be business. It could be community. Sometimes the world's too big. Yeah. But at the end of the well, day, I think they're all one in the same. I know. I know. Well, you know what? Maybe I come to, uh, I thought you were going to ask me about my mentor. So I was quickly trying to think, who am I? How do I decide who to say? Um, you know what? There's a saying that we have in this building. There's this in our home at the beginning of our instructor manual. And it's a Maya Angelou saying. Um and it's, oh, geez, am I going to be able to quote it? I think I know this saying already, and I think I love it. But I'll, I'll, I'll say it, but I won't make any assumptions. You're going to make me kind of say this here on the spot. Yeah, so it's basically just that, you know, people might forget about what I say. They might forget about what I do. But, you know, you don't want them to ever forget how you made them feel. That's not exactly it. But I think that, to me, has always resonated with me, is that I really do want um, – that that's important to me. And, and I, you know, I hope that's what I bring to, you know, my family and first and foremost, and then, you know, our company. And then we want everybody when they come into here to feel that way too. So it's how you make someone feel right. And um, so maybe that's uh, maybe I'll leave off on that one. I love it. Maya Angelou is a very wise woman. And I think that is it. We remember how we felt about that experience and hopefully we can put some good experiences out there. I love that that's your impact. You've enlightened us with so much great information. Thank you for peeling back the curtain a bit into your own life, into your business. I think what you do is fantastic. I'm glad you are out there doing it. And it was a pleasure having you on the show, Deb. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. Much appreciated. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to the Good Neighbor Podcast Midhurst. To nominate your favorite local businesses to be featured on the show, go to gnpmidhurst.com. That's gnpmidhurst.com or call 705-413-3775.